hard to continue after this session, but I um, have to go on. Thank you. Well, did you ever heard about data-driven design? Um, for sure, you saw the output in some amazing video or infographics with numbers and names flying around and so on. Our next guest will look at the ancient history of visual storytelling and reflect on the modern movement of data-driving design. I'm excited to introduce you, Jess and Leslie from Yes3. I think that would make me Leslie. Leslie was actually going to come, and uh, I'm Brad, so I replaced her. No, no, it's fine. Well, yeah, so it's great to be here with you guys. It's a, sort of a tough panel to, to follow. It was a, very impressive. Um, well, I'm, the, the, I'm Jesse Thomas, and I'm the CEO and founder of Just3, and we're a, an interactive agency with some awesome clients you may have heard of, like Google, Facebook, Twitter, Nike, NASA. Um, today we're going to talk to you guys about, uh, contrary to what was said before, uh, community building uh, on social channels from a brand's perspective. Uh, and a term that we're going to use is snackable content. Um, when you think about it, a snack can be anything from junk food to tapas. Um, snacks are something that someone can consume in a standing. Um, and in a social setting, snacks um, have new meaning. Uh, when you think about it, Twitter has a 140 character limit. You could think of those characters as calories. Um, mobile is like feeding people on a diet, right? Because they can, they can only consume uh, certain things through the bandwidth. Uh, in the context of a brand marketer, um, let's say that you're a pig farmer and you're hosting a party. You might serve your pork products, but you might also source uh, some, some cheese, some local cheese perhaps, right? Um, so the trick is to embrace what you have but to also supplement with complementary snacks as it relates to the content you're pushing on these social channels. Um, snacks should be efficient to serve and also to consume. Um, you should make time to entertain at your parties. So a lot of marketers will go to Facebook, post some stuff, and then leave. But what you're supposed to really do is engage with your, with your consumers. So you don't want to be the host that slaves in the kitchen and runs into the, into the party to drop off the food and then runs back into the kitchen, sweating. Um, so the trick is to engage while, while entertaining your guests. Uh, so Brad is our director of strategy and is going to lead the talk. Uh, please ask questions in Spanish and English uh, bef during and after. Yeah, and feel free to raise your hand during. We're, we're happy to stop and take questions about anything. And hablo español, entonces si quieres preguntar algo. Uh, okay, so yeah, content, oh actually where's the remote? So content, uh, we've been talking a lot about apps and development and different things like that. Um, uh, we've been, and, and we've even talked about some, a lot of it mobile, but some of it on the desktop. And content is one of the things that is um, important no matter what you're doing. Um, and content can really mean anything. And so uh, it's important to think about what can you do to make your content so that people want to get it as much as possible. Um, and so that's, that's really what we're, what we're focusing on today. Um, you know, you've seen all kinds of different statistics already. Everything's getting bigger. Everything's getting faster. Uh, there's more websites than ever before. The number of people accessing the internet is skyrocketing, especially because of mobile in access in places where there didn't used to be connections that wire, wireless connections have, you know, leapfrogged over not even ever having landlines available. Um, and you know, it's, a, it's an interesting time to sort of uh, take advantage of that. And I think that there's been some predictions that have said that as soon as 2013, the number of searches via mobile devices, like, uh, like Google searches, um, is going to uh, be larger than the number of Google searches from desktop. So this is, you know, it's a really relevant time. But the question is, all those people are using it. How do we make sure that our content gets out to them? So. An important thing to remember is that the bigger your community is, the faster your community can grow. Um, and one of the points here is that the early adopters that come to you are the most important people for, a, for, the, for the entire ramp up period of whatever it is you're doing. Um, because when I connect to you, 
I'm not just connecting to you, I'm also connecting to the people you're connected with. So you're much more important to me than just one person. It's you're important to me for your network. So you can grow like a simple interest method. If you think about it in terms of money and you put money in the bank and you get interest on it, in terms of simple interest, um, I could just keep putting money in the bank and saving money. I could just keep having people come to whatever content I'm producing. Let's say it's a blog. Um, I could just keep having people come to that and they would, I, I would get a few people every so often. But if I manage to leverage it in a way where the people that they're connected to are drawn in as well, then it's a much faster growth cycle. So um, the, the idea is that if you're not building you know, your communities, everyone else is, and you're gonna sort of get left behind. It's like um, when, you're, when you're growing plants or in a forest environment, if there's a fire, then there's lots of room for everything to grow after the fire uh, or after you plow a field. But if things have been growing for a long time, then there's not a lot of space left for you to fit in. And so when there's been a disruption, and mobile is a big disruption right now, um, that's a great opportunity to get in early and for less money and less energy, you can make a bigger splash and get more attention when you're earlier sort of in a, in a situation. And um, it's, you know, just essentially, if you think about like the tele, telephone companies versus Skype, the tel, you know, Skype came in and they were the first ones there. They've now been bought by Microsoft, but the different telephone companies don't, most of them still don't really have an offering like that and they don't really want one because they're afraid it's gonna make them earn less money. But now Skype is so established that some, it's, it's the energy it's gonna take to establish yourself in that market is gonna be much, much more. It's gonna take a lot more money and time and energy. So um, the key here is that when you're thinking about producing content and what you're going to uh, put out, it, it, one thing is to be snackable, but you can't, just because you make something that's a, a snackable piece of content that somebody can easily consume and easily share, it doesn't necessarily mean that um, it's going to go viral and hit millions of people. Um, and you can't uh, bet on that. You can't assume that I'm gonna spend a million dollars on this YouTube clip and it's gonna go viral and will be worth it. Really, the, the strategy that you want is one of sort of regular quality content. And if you continue to put out things that are beneficial on a smaller scale, then the odds that one of them really elevates and um, becomes viral or reaches a lot of people, that may happen and, and you will get that, but you, you can't plan for that. Um, you can do everything in your power to enable that, but the better plan is to look for a steady trajectory and then if you get a big viral moment, then that's a bonus. That's a good thing. And, and, uh, and it's successful if you do it, but you should plan on just sort of like a more steady trajectory. Um, and the way to do that is to build quality content. Um, you know, if we're talking about snacks, then uh, if you make a bunch of good snacks, I, I don't know what the one is that's gonna make people come back to my cafe over and over and over again every day because they're addicted to it. Um, I don't know which one that's gonna be. So I make 10 that are all as good as I can get them and maybe one of those becomes that thing. But you, in terms of your brand, um, when you think about your brand, you don't wanna cut corners on how people understand your brand. And so you also don't wanna cut corners on the product that you make, the stories that you tell to represent your brand. And so it's, it's important in that way. Um, and when you put that product or the content or whatever it is out there, um, this is what it has to achieve. So it has to resonate within your community. It has to uh, be something that members of your community want to share. It has to get pushed out by the core of your community. So you have these members of the community that you can count on. They always interact with you. You wanna make sure it's something that they don't just wanna share with each other. They also want to share to sort of that next layer of people that they're connected to that may not be the core constituency. And um, when that happens, then the idea is that you help to bring those people in and make them more core by having this stuff get shared out to them. You wanna expand your network that way. You also wanna 
by doing that, attract those sort of fringe in individuals into the core or closer to the core of your community so that the next time you do this, um, it's, it's sort of uh, happening to their relationships. Um, and then you want to encourage repeat interactions and interactivity, you know, rather than just a one-time hit. If I do something great and you come see it and I never see you again, there's limited value in that. But if I do something great that you want to come back to multiple times and that it gets more fun each time you come back, then that's even better. So taking a step back, what is a social object? A social object is a term from sociology that I use to talk about the things that um, people talk about or converse about, the thing that's shared. It could be a blog post. It could be a video on YouTube. It could be a concept that isn't actually anywhere yet. And that's why it's important. That's why I use a vague term. It's not a very specific term. Because uh, what you can share on the internet is pretty lim limited, uh, limitless. Sorry. It's pretty limitless. And so you, can, you have an opportunity to sort of be creative and say, well, what is the thing that I can put out to my community that they will be able to understand quickly but will resonate and be really important to them. And um, if it's an idea, then how do I want to represent that idea? Should it be a picture? Should it be a video? And um, just to go deeper onto that, this is my answer on a website, a question and answer website called Quora for the question of what is a social object. And so my answer to what a social object is is itself a social object that I could give you a link to. And then you can go share it. Uh, and it is something that can become something that people have a conversation about. Now, um, my answer to what a social object is is not particularly interesting in general. Like, I'm not going to get a million people looking at this ever uh, because it's only really relevant to people who are interested in trying to understand this. But um, as an example, it's just the idea that you can turn anything into a social object. The key is to try to make it something that fits your community. What are they hungry for? So um, the key things that you have to think about when deciding what to make are, well, how can I create the right, right social object for, your, for my community? And that's something that uh, comes with knowing your community. And if you, you may need to ask somebody else. Not everybody is the right person to look at their community and say, uh, and, and interpret what it is that they're hungry for. Um, you know, we're not, we're not all Steve Jobs. We're not all the ones who can say, uh, I'm going to make this iPad and everybody's going to buy it. I, you know, that's, you know, there's a reason why he is who he is and there's not many other people like that. But there's people who do have talent that way. And if it's not you, don't be afraid to find somebody else to help out. Um, and then you want to uh, provide it to them with the fewest barriers for sharing. And so um, look at the user experience on your website um, and really look at it with a critical eye in terms of how, how many steps do I have to go through to consume this thing and then put it back out to somebody else and share it. And as much as possible, you want to get rid of those barriers because every one of those barriers is going to result in a significant percentage loss of whatever that potential maximum uh, sharing and visitation is. And then the last one is to create the most you can, as much as you can, incentives for people to um, share it and also return. And a lot of that can come back to um, things that we find in games, game mechanics, and also um, just you know what is a what is a what's a value to me as a user to come and experience this, um, and how can I give you something, whether it's money or prestige or uh, you know, a badge, or uh, you know, some sort of preferred treatment, or, some, or privilege on, in the community. Um, but taking it back to the idea of snacks and being snackable. So um, you know, what does snackable really, really mean? It's, it, it, to us, it means visualization. And we think of visualization as, um, you know, a way of organizing information. It could be a, an infographic that, you know, it could be a poster. It could be something dynamic that's fed real-time data. But 
Um, in our society today, people's attention spans are shrinking. Uh, if, if they're not already shrunk to zero, they're getting close. And so doing some sort of data visualization is a way to take a complex concept and package it in something that I can look at very quickly, understand, decide, hey, I like that, and hey, I should give that to somebody else also because it's pretty cool. Um, you know, it's, so it's pictures that tell stories. It's bite-sized nuggets of content. It's meaning that you can grasp very quickly, um, you know, especially you know, on your phone or on your desktop, or you know, what's the medium that this is coming in on, and am I going to be able to understand it there? And then it's also you know, faster than reading an explanation. But as a companion piece to that, it's important to understand that um, you can still write a blog post. You can still um, put up a 3,000 word Wikipedia article um, and support that snackable piece of information. But you have to understand, what's the, what is the fast thing? What is the thing that's going to move through the social graph very quickly and then um, as a companion, you can link that back to deeper information or supporting information. But just writing a, a 5,000 word blog post, that's not easy to spread. But if you make a part of that something that people will want to share to bring people back to that description and that deeper meaning, um, then those things can work uh, together. Um, and another piece is to really make something snackable, a lot of times it should, it should be a story. It should be in a narrative. Um, just being a fact can be successful if it's a particularly interesting fact. But a lot of times facts are not as interesting if they're, out, if they're not placed into a specific context um, and into a narrative. And so you know, telling stories is how we communicate, and it's always how, been how we communicated. Um, everything is a story. So think about what the story is for this. Um, it, a lot of it has to do with presentation. It's not, just, um, the, it's not just the piece of information. It's also how I, how I deliver it to you. So if I have a giant steak or a, what was the, the rice uh, cup, the arroz, the, 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 the pastel, que comimos? Yeah, pastel de arroz. If I have one of those, uh, on a plate, and I offer it to you guys, and I say, would you like this? Um, the, the answer for most of you is probably going to be yes. Uh, if, I, if I take it, and I drop it on the floor, and I say, now do you want it? <laughs> it's the same thing. It's, like, it's the same piece of content. It's the same snackable item, but it doesn't look as good down there. And you're a lot less likely to tell your friends about it. Well, you're a lot less likely to tell your friends about it in a positive way. You probably would go say, hey, I went and saw this American guy throw pastries on the floor, but that's okay. Uh, so humans tell stories, and, and so the, the method, the medium we're using to tell the stories has changed, but you still have, there's etiquette issues that you still have to pay attention to. So um, in America, I, I haven't seen it so much here, but in America I see it a lot where there's restaurants and stores and things, and you walk in and there's a giant banner that says, um, like us on Facebook. Um, the worst ones don't even have a, a short URL or, any, or a QR code or anything that you could actually use to, to do that right there. Uh, they don't even tell you how to search for it or what the name of the page is or anything like that. Um, it, just, it just says, like us on Facebook. And the, the point is that if you do that, you're really just saying you're asking someone for a favor who they're coming into your place and you're supposed to be helping them. You're, you're paying them and they're saying, yeah, but do me a favor first. Um, and so it's important to remember that you can't just tell people, hey, like this, or hey, um, this is important to you. You need to do the work to make sure that it is important to them, to make sure that it's something that they want to like. And the better it is, the, the less effort it is to get people to like it. And, and this is a particularly hard thing for some people because uh, a lot of people want the social graph to react to them in a specific way, but you can't always control that. And that's also, going back to the earlier point, the reason why you don't want to, you don't want to predict that something is going viral because it's not your decision. Um, 
But the more you practice and the more often that you release uh, an, a piece of information, um, one of them might do that. So successful strategy for, so, for sharing these, these snackable social objects. One, tell the right story. Two, tell it to the right group. And three, make sure you tell it well, right? So the right snack to the hungry person on a plate instead of the floor. And then they eat it. Um, so now we want to talk about sort of two different to a distinction between two different kinds of data visualization or, or information visualization. Um, one is sort of prepackaged and the other is custom. And prepackaged is like going to Burger King. Um, and you get the bag with the thing in it. It's, it's, you can have anything you want to eat here as long as it's one of the things that we tell you you can have. Um, and the other is like getting a bunch of ingredients and learning how to cook. Um, it's more work for you but you get exactly what you want. So the, um, this is an example of a, of a prepackaged data visualization. There's actually another one right here. And this is an example of a, of a prepackaged one that does a good job. There's no reason to sit down and code a customized widget to share Twitter for the Nonic conference up on the screen. That's a waste of time and resources. But when you're trying to do something sort of different or something that's going to reach out to the community in a different way, um, sometimes it's a real negative to, to use something packaged. So this is a, on the screen, there's a, a graph, and it's from a, a Twitter stream graph website. And it's very cool. Uh, you put in a keyword, and it searches the last thousand tweets on that keyword and does a graph like this where it labels different sections and what uh, portion of the conversation they took up around that keyword um, over time. Um, and so I think this one was the one for data visualization. And uh, you can uh, just see different words that came up with it over time. But if, if I'm a brand, I can't change this to be the color I want it to be. I can't make it go up and down instead of left to right. Um, I can't make it be out from the middle of a circle instead of left to right. Um, and so it has limitations in terms of what you can really do with it. Um, you know, but it's easy. But on the other side of things is you know, something custom where you know, I've got a bunch of ingredients and I can do exactly what I want to do with them. And this is a screenshot of a project that Jess3 did with Samsung at um, the South by Southwest interactive uh, conference in Austin, which is a big sort of tech-oriented music and uh, music and technology conference um, and art. But this basically took uh, check-ins from people at different places in Austin and sort of elevated locations to the top of a list in real time. And you could, there was an installation with screens that you could watch or you could just go to you know, uh, the web on a, on a phone or, or on your computer and watch in real time and use it to see uh, functionally where is everybody going right now. Um, and so uh, you know, but it was also something that you know could be branded in any way, or or, or use different pieces of data um, in different ways. And I know I had a I had a point about this one that I forgot that I wanted to talk about. Um, oh no, I already said it. Uh, so, but what you use for this are these custom elements, right? So. Um, you've got things like username, birthday, the, you know, the, a lot of these are standard across different social platforms, but a lot of them, um, you, you know, there's some variants. Foursquare might have this and Facebook might have that and, you know, there's some that are everywhere and some that are unique, but you've got this kind of thing and you've got it from many different platforms. And so it's the idea of, you know, now when you're thinking about things in terms of a custom application, it's, you know, you've got this ability to mix and match whatever you need to create the thing you want to create. Um, so the, the, the final piece is, okay, so we've, we've made something custom, we've made it relevant to our community, and we're delivering it in the right way. How do we get people to come back more than once? Um, what are the game mechanics that we can attach to this? And um, the important thing to remember about why this is so important is that there's a lot of competition out there for people's attention. 
um, the, you know, look around the room. Everybody in this room is working on different projects, and all of those projects want people's time. Um, and so you do, ha you know, this is something that you really have to spend some time thinking about because um, you're not just competing with everybody else in this room, you're also competing with every other mobile application uh, and the internet and television and face to face relationships. Um, and, you know, you're never going to win all of that time. But you want to, you really do want to put some time into thinking about how to make sure this is something people want to come back to. Um, and there's kind of two levels of game mechanics. There's, there's light stuff, and then there's heavy stuff. Heavy stuff is creating a whole gaming platform, you know, like a, like a functional game that has a leaderboard uh, that shows who's winning and keeps score and, uh, you know, all kinds of different, you know, Foursquare with badges and different things like that. That's a, that's an, that is a full game. But there's smaller things. There's little tricks that you can do to make people think they're having fun, like little sort of mini game experiences. And that's a lot like what Zach did with his website, where sort of everything that happens on that website, you know, when you, you're wondering what this has to do with dinner, and then every experience you have is hilarious. And so, you know, even to the point where you, the, the piece you click to find more about Zach, uh, it's just funny. And you find yourself wanting to click it again and click it again and click it again. Um, there was another one of those, right? Uh, there was, there's, there's a site, the most, the most awesomest thing ever. Uh, I don't know if you guys have ever seen it. Most awesomest thing ever .com. It just puts one thing next to another, and maybe we can pull it up afterwards, but it's a great example of how everything you do on that screen makes you feel like you just won a little tiny, tiny game. And things like Groupon and Living Social, they, by picking one deal, right. you're automatically, you know, you, you get right to the deal rather than having to search through stuff that you don't really necessarily want. Right. You get right to this deal. Right. And in all of those, it's, it's like, it feels like an exclusive offer. It feels like I'm winning when I buy it. It feels like I just won a great deal, you know, and whether that's true or not is, uh, you know, up for debate, and, uh, but, uh, but you feel like that. Um, so... It doesn't end with being seen and shared, and uh, you know it's important to um, you know get people back to see you. That's the key. Um, other examples are Reddit. Uh, I don't know if are any of you guys on Reddit? No? Yeah, a few. So Reddit.com is uh, you know it's a it's sort of like a forum, uh, but they have a system called Karma, and if I post something interesting and people like it then I get karma points. Um, if I, and the more karma points you have, sort of the more credibility you have in this community. And the more credibility you have in this community, the sort of more fun it is for you to interact with people. And so it gets into this virtuous cycle of, oops, let's change the volume. Virtuous cycle of making you get more karma points so that you can interact more, so that you can get more karma points. Another one is Twitter, which uh, has its follower numbers. And especially in the very, very early days of Twitter, people were very fixated on how many followers they had. It's, it's a little bit less like that now, but people still pay a lot of attention to it. Um, but it's the idea that um, it made people pay attention to their friends, and it made people want to come back to get that, I need three more followers, and I'll have more followers than my friends. And that's, that was an important thing for them. And so um, the key there that it also did, and this is an important thing to remember, is putting in game mechanics like that can help you keep people on your site long enough for them to understand the other values that you can provide. So a lot of these people on Twitter, they didn't quite understand why they liked this or what information they were getting. But it kept them all engaged, and the longer they were engaged, the more they learned that they could use this service for something else. And so even if you're just adding something small that gets people to come back a few times, that means that they're coming to your site an extra three times where they have an opportunity to get over some of the adoption barriers to become a true user of your site, understand what the value is, and become a long-term relationship. Yeah, and another example. This one has just tweeted that uh, Angry Birds has just released some new levels, and for, I guess for all of us to play Angry Birds, some of the different, you know, like Angry Birds Rio and some of these other variations of it, they'll have 
they'll, they'll give you kind of one of five of the level, you know, the packets of levels, and they'll say, this, you know, May 2011, this block will be released, and then they're giving you something to look forward to. Um, right. So that's an example, a game inside of a game. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so this is just another example. Um, this is uh, something else that Jess3 worked on, the uh, O Music uh, Awards, the OMAs for MTV, which was O was online, so online music awards. Um, and this is a, one of the screenshots from there where you see it's got the top super fans. And um, you got different points. You got points for voting. The more you voted, the more points you got. Um, but you also see you could get different badges for different kinds of activities that you would do. And so there's levels upon levels upon levels of, of games here, and it made it really interactive. So first level is I vote for my band that I like. That's like I win, I win a game right there. Um, but then on top of it, I get points from the system for voting. And then on top of that, other actions get me badges that I can show people I've achieved. And then there's a leaderboard to say, hey, you've been doing the most. We're going to feature you on this site, which gives you sort of like, you know, you feel privileged. And you then might tell your friends, hey, you should come see this. I'm, a, I'm on this. But it's also bragging rights. And there's urgency because there's this actual award show. Right. So we were inspired by um, fantasy football, fantasy American football, which is quite a popular pastime in America. I don't know if you have the equivalent in, in Europe with, with soccer or whatever, but um, the idea of having this kind of virtual layer on top of another game that you can't play, right? You can't play football, but you can pick the winner in the same way. You can't be Kanye West, but you can, you can support vote. him yeah. or you can play the game. It's, it's versatile. Yeah, and then, and then there's a whole other layer on top of that because by, you know, each of these people, Kanye West, Lady, Ga you know, Lady Gaga and Justin Bieber, who we found out had different predictive typing personalities, um, they have communities behind them. And those are very distinct communities. And the people who like Justin Bieber, for the most part, probably don't like Lady Gaga and vice versa. And so if you have a system here that allows people to see the vote counts of who's voting for who and who's winning, then all of a sudden you get those entire communities engaged where everybody who likes Justin Bieber start to rally and say, hey, we're, we're 100,000 points behind Lady Gaga. We have to all vote more. And then you're engaging communities to engage themselves and to recruit the rest of their community. Um, so at the beginning, you can imagine not every fan of Justin Bieber is on this website voting, but they start to see that Justin Bieber isn't winning and they start to recruit through their social graph all of the other Justin Bieber fans and activating that community to come in and participate here. And then all of a sudden, the numbers start to go up. And then Lady Gaga says, well, hey, now we're losing. And so we have to go get more of our people. And all of these interactions across all of these different categories of voting can really, um, you can just visualize that it's this, it's this activity point that continues to give people reasons and incentives to reach out and drag other people into this thing with them. And a big part of that is simplicity, because you don't want to drag somebody into something boring, right? I mean, Hot or Not is one of the great examples of this on the web. So many of these websites were inspired in sort of bit, bits of the Hot or Not strategy, but it's such a really interesting concept. You can go, you can vote once, and you can leave. You can tell somebody about it. You can vote a thousand times, but it's creating something as simple as possible, which is the trick. You don't want it to, this is almost, the fantasy f um, football and this kind of approach are almost only for a certain kind of educated um, user, but yeah. it's, it's charming when you see games like a Tetris or something that an advanced user can use. And an angry, an angry Bird. Angry Bird's yeah. another good example. But, um, you know, so this, you know, this just sort of is, the, is a final example of like the points that we were bringing up. You want to, you know, you want to get the right message. You want to make it snackable. You want to uh, make sure it's customized for, for the community. You want to make sure you are thinking about the right community and that that's who you send it to, that you send it to them through the right channels, um, and then that you create these mechanics to get them to come back again. Um, and that's the last uh, slide. So thank you. Skerry Casco. Any questions for just three? I just want one, at least one. Yeah. Uh, good
Good afternoon. Uh, first of all, my English is not very well, so I'm going to ask you in Spanish sí, English. Okay. Uh, you have uh, spoken of uh, Angry Birds, but I think it's not uh, the, um, the same thing that you are uh, speaking of. Uh, in, uh, no hay interactuación con el... Sí. With the with the people who's playing and there is no community, there is no right. answer, there is no. So right. I don't I don't know how to do, uh, to um, to give the games mm -hmm. this interactivity or right. It's uh, it's exceedingly difficult. Uh, you know, it's it basically saying Angry Birds isn't interactive it's it's a, you're 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 on this game by yourself you're playing on your own um, you know maybe you can compare scores but that's about it um, but the, the whole point you know really this should have been a point that was worked into the uh, presentation itself all you know all of these slides really just come back to the idea of what you need to do is steal ideas from everybody else about how things work and apply the ones that you can to whatever it is you're doing. And so Angry Birds, what they solved was that it's something simple that everyone can do. And that's why they have the adoption numbers that they have. Um, but, you know, yeah, they, they don't have that other piece. And so. Um, well, okay, Ang Angry Birds was brought up because someone had tweeted it in the stream. So the only reason I brought that up was the context of how they're, they're teasing the levels, right? And that's, that's part of right. creating a game is that it's not, you want people to come but, back. But it's, it is. but the, I mean the point is we have something we have something to learn from from every you know all of these anything that's successful there's something to learn from it and so you look at Angry Birds and you say why is that successful you look at Foursquare and you say why is that successful um, and and in that case it's the simplicity but it's you know there's no with with things like this with producing content that's the you know the reason that agencies like Jest three exist it, because there's no easy answer and. Um, I've had people ask me before, like raise their hand and say, well, what should I do? And it's like, I, I don't know what you should do because I don't even know, you know, what your company is yet. And so what, you know, that's essentially what we get paid to do is to say, is to come in and talk to you and understand what you do. And then, and only then can we sort of suggest how things work. So really all this is, is just sort of principles to, it's like a checklist that um, it's never easy to find a way to put those check to put all of the items in the list into what you're doing, but it's something that you want to strive to do because they're all good principles for sort of, you know, increasing engagement. And also just to be aware of, the, I really like the farm analogy because I think a lot of farmers get so caught up in creating the product, because it is hard, of course, to make a living as a farmer, that they don't do a good enough job about marketing themselves, their products, and, and they oftentimes when they're selling their products will just sell that individual thing and um, it's just, taking a step back and kind of doing justice to all this hard work you've done. And um, right. we're, we're using the literal um, metaphor as a farmer now, but it, think of your brand. Like, what is this product that your brand is, 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 has created? And then for some brands, it's easier than others to, to figure that out and figure out a way that you can basically give a sample. Think of it like when you go to a farmer's market, one of the most successful strategies is people give out samples. And farmers that have next to no money will do this because they know that if someone tries their amazing ham or fruit or whatever, they're going to come back. And so a lot of this stuff is just sampling. It's, it's how can you do sampling in an easy way, spending as little money as possible um, and not creating a, a, a new workflow that you, where you, you've now created a new workflow to, to do marketing. Marketing should be easy because you don't want to waste a, money from your product design. There's a uh, communications researcher uh, from the 50s and 60s named Marshall McLuhan. And he had a book called The Medium is the Message. The medium is the message. It was also called the medium is the massage, but it really was the medium is the message. And um, this is part of that, that the way that you're delivering whatever it is you're delivering is just as important as whatever it is you're delivering. Um, so, and it's, it's just, it, it goes right back to what I was saying about the, the pastry. Um, how I give it to you is as important as how good it tastes. And so, th like, that's what we're really trying to communicate is just try to try to think about how you're giving this to people from their perspective um, and make that as good for them as it can be. 
And, and thinking about social like it's a party is a really, I think, another powerful analogy because you know LinkedIn is kind of like a networking party. This is like a LinkedIn party, right? So certain things are going to be appropriate, um, but but these things only really apply in the context of that. So this isn't like how you should build a business so much as how you should market a product in the context of a group, in the context of a party. So that's why everything should be positive. You don't really ever want to say anything negative about anyone online because. I don't know, it's not really a good look in a party to be the, you know, to be a negative vibe. So you always want to be putting out positive vibes, you want to be there, you want to be, you want to be active, you want to hopefully be there first. But you don't want to look like you're trying too hard. So there's this kind of sexy balance of just being casual, you know, because you don't, you don't want to try too hard on social channels. That's, um, sometimes that works too. That's, trying too hard is better than not trying at all, which is what a lot of people basically do. They think you're at their party, you're going to be talking about them, but it's a very hard balance between showing hard work and not being too busy because you're doing the hard work to engage with your with your guests. The, the other thing I should say is that everything we said is going to be wrong for somebody. Uh, you know, like these are good principles, but um, you you also you just need to examine where you are. And anything I said up here today may not be the right thing for you, but I think they're good things in general. Is there any there's one over there? Hi, I'm just curious, like, how is your agency organized? Because I'm just looking at your website, and I don't know if it's like heavier in the design part, or you have also engineers, like, because I don't know if you, they, 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 your clients give you the data, or you tr uh, treat it already, or you treat that. I mean, you can explain me a little bit how you work. I think it's very interesting. Yeah, so so we started out as a as a UX agency. So U, UX means user experience. So that's like wireframe. So. Um, we started out, you know, with some really great clients doing that UX work, and, and we early on started working with these social networks. Um, a very early on problem with, so a very early on service that these social networks needed was data viz, and so we started to build out these teams of designers that wanted to focus on data viz, and so we were lucky to be able to work with directly with these social networks to get their data to help them tell their story. Um, we then took that same workflow and just started creating our own stuff because a lot of that, the great thing about social data is it's all, essentially it's all publicly available, which is a, a gift and a curse. But so, we, so, uh, so visual storytelling was kind of that thing after that. So we said now we, we do like motion graphics kind of stories and um, we do have engineers and developers. Of course, that's one of the areas that we need more. So if you guys are any developers and you know, work for us, uh, send me an email. But um, yeah, we're very heavy on design. And then strategy, consulting, and PR have always been services that we've kind of done as well, because when you're dealing with these large clients, strategy is kind of included, or it's a sort of a separate service, but it's always included. You, 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 it, big brands sort of require smart thinking. Um, think, but recently we've been building out strategy. It depends on what the client needs. Um, if the client needs, that, that's what, I mean, I really think that's a reflection of exactly what we were talking about in the answer to the previous question which is that this stuff's complicated and so clients, especially big clients, often come and they say, you know, we want this, we want to make something go viral. <laughs> and, and it's like, well, let's take a step back. Wh who are you? What do you do? What do you have to share? And maybe they, maybe they have someone on their team who is good at Twitter and good at Facebook and they just need some consulting. Maybe they need consulting and they also need a design production agency to make things for them and say, this is how you should share it, but we trust you to go do it. But then there's other places that say, we, we don't even know where to start and we want somebody to manage this and, uh, and teach us how to do it, but for the first six months or 18 months or whatever, uh, we need somebody to hold our hands and do it for us and show us what you're doing so that, um, you know, and then down the road, we'll take that over, but we're still gonna want you to help provide us with that content. Um, you know, and then there's and then there's people that need development that they actually need something built, and you know, then that's the that's another layer on top of the strategy and the design. So yeah, and, and one thing that we've tried to do differently is like so t traditionally w w the people that we're kind of replacing are the are the news organizations of the world, right? Th these are the people that have been creating infographics since forever, right? They this is what they do. But what we're we've tried to go in a different direction and kind of earn our earn our keep or earn our um, earn the fees is that we're adding another layer of design and thus branding to the storytelling. And so that's definitely something that's unique that most news organizations wouldn't sort of approach. Also, who's paying for the, for the work is typically 
or sort of takes it a new direction because integrity is a big part of information design. And so when someone's paying you and telling you what to do, especially when it becomes like a video or something where it's, no, it's, it's very, it, it's, it changes from just a graphic, um, it, the subjectiveness of it. And so, yeah, we have to wrestle with that. We're also based in DC where a lot of this uh, stuff is relating to politics and issue advocacy, where it gets even more tricky. Um, so we try and have a really high level moral compass. We try and think of ourselves like a media organization uh, or, you know, we try and think like them um, and just have that level of integrity because it's very easy to basically change the numbers and make it look good for, for the client. But I, we, we've gotten very mature about that early on. Um, but politics and information design is a very interesting mix. Any other questions? So thank you, Yes3, for being here on, and sharing with us uh, so interesting knowledge. Thank you. Thank you to Nonek. It's been great. Well, there is time for another question. It's so, one with the, the last question. Of Somebody the day. thought of one. Last chance. We got one. You have? Oh, well. Okay. Okay, just a quick one. Um, so I hear quite a bit about game dynamics these days. Um, well. But I'm, I'm wondering if you guys can point to a serious productivity product that uses game dynamics? So, so there's some, some sort of examples in, in things that we use as utilities like email, for instance, is a sort of a very um, obvious one we're actually working on right now, game mechanics for Gmail. One of the things that's inherently built into Gmail is the, um, or in any email client, is the, is the numbers in your inbox. So a game that people play with themselves is trying to get the number of their inbox to zero. The question you're asking, I think, is trying, trying to get to the more serious side of gaming or the more um, um, in, inadvertent games. Kiva is an example of this. Kickstarter. Kickstarter is a really cool site. If you haven't seen it, it's basically a way for you to crowdsource products like you know, a book being written or um, a project being done. But, but those are ways where they've taken fundraising and made it a game. Causes.org. Using, using um, you know, it'll be like a temperature dial when people do donations, right? And it starts here, and they're trying to get it to go up. That's a visual indicator that's, you would see that in a game, right? When you earn points, it goes up. I think, and, and there's also, I mean, um, your, what you do is very much market, like you, some of the probability stuff that you were doing is market related. Um, and I think markets are games, you know, in a lot of ways. And so um, anything, I'm not saying that, like yours, you know, that's all back end stuff. But like anything that sort of brings in that market aspect as well is is bringing some of that effect in, and you know it's it's um some like I, the truth is that like with the email inbox counter that's that's integral like it you know it it's both a game and it also sort of has to be there to be a functional tool. So some of these things you can't separate them, but you know. But then other times you can bring it in as a productive addition. Another one I really like is like when you go to Google.com, the Google Doodles, those aren't really games, but sometimes they'll have this, this yeah. fun experience. Okay, thank you very much for your keynote. You look gorgeous. Thank you. Keep it on.